on that. Let's go ahead and get started. Dustin, what do you think? Yeah, I'm good with that. Uh, one of the All first right. things that I want to mention before we get started is that um, in no way, shape, or form is this going to be uh, a film study as to try and uh, make fun of any officials for improper mechanics or um, missed calls or wrong calls. Uh, this particular film study is for us to get better as an association. <clears throat> and the great thing about it is that it's game film from <laughs> LHSLO games that we have officiated. So you're going to see, um, you know, all of the Lola officials in these clips that we have here. Uh, Bill and I, we spent a good bit of time going through all the film and trying to pull out these clips so we can have this particular study here. <clears throat> and in there are no particular order as far as severity of foul. But I think the first few clips that we're going to be looking at are dealing with uh, crease violations. But what we're looking at here is a team in white in possession of the ball. He's going to be driving towards the crease. He's going to take a shot on goal. And you can see here he's going to dive as he's making his shot and actually lands in the crease. All right, Dustin, uh, I do have a question for this one. So, guys, scroll down to play number one, best call, and vote what you think is the best thing to do on this play. Okay, let's see what we got in the way of voting. We got uh, five people have voted. Three say crease violation, immediate whistle, and two say crease violation, play on. Dustin, what do you think? Okay, so the reason why this will – not be an immediate whistle is because the ball is loose okay so if the ball is loose in the crease and the attackman is in the crease this would simply be a play on um now if the goalie has possession of the ball once he steps into the crease or after his shot then yes that would be an immediate whistle but um you can see here the goalie makes a save, but he doesn't get possession of the ball. And then White goes into the crease. And so we would have a play on here, not an immediate whistle. One thing that I want to point out here as far as mechanics, um, take a look at the lead official. You can see the lead official on the 10-yard line. And the lead official is standing on the numbers. Now, one thing I can tell you is that if we have action around the crease, we have to be as close to that crease as we possibly can get. I'm talking about literally being able to get as close as to stepping a foot inside of the crease. I've done that before. Um, you have to find a way to stay out of the play, but we have to make sure that we can get as close to the crease as we can because, honestly, if you are that far away from the crease, it's hard to sell a crease violation. So just a key reminder um, for lead officials, we need to make sure that we are – tight on the crease when we have action around it. We can't be out that far. He does take a couple of steps towards the crease, which is good, but it probably looked better if he took a couple of quick jogs and got right up close to the backs of those players. Um, you can see how the, the film zooms in kind of as the, the play is being made. And at that point right there, we should see the official in the frame when we have tight play like that. If he's not in that frame when we're in – you can see how far right there. He's too far. He's too far out there. Casey's asking, should he sit, should he head straight in from the on the ten yard line or loop loop in? I think you just find a good opening where you're not gonna interfere with the players and get as close as you can. Yeah, I'm I'm with that. I mean, there's never a specific direction that you have to travel, but it's get to the best spot that's available to you to where you can see the play best. <laughs> But I guess in theory, yes, you would want to come right down that 10-yard line. You want to be on the GLE, um, whether you're a yard above um, or a yard below. You'll be fine there. But, again, I'm just more concerned about how far out. Okay. Hey, are you guys hearing me yet? Yeah, Lux, see you, Lux, and I can hear you, Lux. Okay. Uh, Sorry, you new no. fellas, this is uh, Colonel Steve Luxian. He's our chief referee. He's a very accomplished official, and he's going <laughs> to – lead some of this kibitzing as well on this on this whether it's a play on or immediate whistle if the ball bounced at the feet of uh, opposite players and it wasn't clear that that blue long pole was going to pick it up 
immediately. I think you could blow a real quick whistle and just give it to the defensive team. You know, if it looks like nothing good's going to come of it, because if you let that play on go and somebody comes and clocks some now clocks somebody, now you're going to have all this simultaneous business. Um, yeah, as a technique, it's it's the de- defense is going to be defensive ball and the ball's on the crease. That's usually a good time just to blow it dead. If it's out on the side where the defense can really get a fast break, then you know, maybe you let it play a little longer. It's kind of my thought. Anything around the crease, people are going to get wiped out. So get that whistle quick. I think in this one, though, Dustin, I, I agree with you that it's not wrong to let, let the play on. The guy picked it up, gave it to the goalie. You saved yourself a whistle. Yeah. It yeah. worked and it worked in this play. Yeah, in that case with the goal, I just I'm just catching up now. It's a little this is the jumpy. first play. This is the first one. Yeah, it's a little jumpy, so it's hard to, for me to pick it up. But okay. All right. And then uh just on the comment about coming in the line or staying above or below, um, you, you gotta have visibility. Obviously, you wanna be as close to that line on a shot. So you can see where the ball is in relationship to the goalpost. Um, the line is not always perfect. Uh, you want to make sure it clears all the way through the plane of the goal. But Tim, sorry. But you can be above or below to make sure you don't get lined out by any kind of players and how the play flows. Sometimes that um, lead ref finds himself below the goal, and there's really nothing wrong with that. It kind of opens up the field but just make sure you're able to get to a position where you can look right down that goal line or close to it so that you can make the judgment on breaking the plane. Tim Casey brings up a good point. <clears throat> if the ball went in and didn't hit the pipe and the ball went in, would this be a good goal or not? And watch what the shooter does. Number four, watch what he does when he takes this shot. And we do not have a dive rule in Federation rules. There's a dive rule in NCAA. Um, however, you no, know, yeah, there's, yeah, we do. You can't voluntarily yeah. leave your feet on your own volition while you're I shooting. I'm, I'm, I'm I think this guy, correct, but meaning like, um, you can land in the crease, right? Yeah, you, you, yeah, you can't land in the crease. Yeah, if you in, in high school, if you leave your feet under your own volition, under your own free will, and I think number four did, he leaned and hopped and you land in the crease, it's no goal whether the ball went in before or after you touch the crease. If you don't jump and you and the ball goes in before you touch the crease, the goal is good. If it goes in uh, after you touch the crease, the goal is no good. And of course, there's all kinds of other things. You can't be inside the plane of the crease and touch the goalie's stick or him or any part right. of the goalie. Right, I'm just talking about leaving yeah. his feet under his own volition. And I think, I think he does. He it's oh, not a, a big, it's not it's it's not a picture perfect. Uh, you know, it's not going to make the cover of U.S. Lacrosse magazine. But, but a good what do you technique think? there, a good technique there to decide is it a push or a leap, leaving of his own volition, is if the if the ref of the guy coming towards you. So let's say the player is moving towards you towards the goal. Watch for the bending of the knees. If he bends his knees and then you know lifts off from that, you can pretty much count on that being leaving the feet, leaving on his own volition. Sometimes you have a push closely associated with it, so you got to decide kind of what happened first. You know, some other things that can happen is if you have an attackman who's who's driving very hard um, and the defense is is riding uh, just as just as aggressive. Uh, he may leave on his own volition, and it may look like the defenseman pushed him in, but he's actually just following the attackman at the same time. So it's kind of like their their momentum is carrying him into uh, the crease, and it, you necessarily wouldn't have a push on that. Um, it would just be the attackman's own momentum taking him in there. We have about three more uh, crease plays here, so we can go ahead on and leave from this particular clip, and we can uh, catch the other um, – I say crease violation, but crease so violation. while that while that uh, clip is coming up, one thing, another kind of technique is as you follow that guy in, you're 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 ready to be on that flag um, as required. If uh, the guy ends up in that crease, it's always better to have a flag down that you can wipe off uh, than you know all the confusion and then having to drop a flag after the. Oh, let me get the loop going. Hold on. Sorry. Yeah. 
This is a quick play here. I think this one's pretty straightforward, huh? Yeah, this is a pretty uh, clear, clear cut um, clip of the attackman going through. I recognize a single side official. But notice here, um, blue is in possession, and he's coming from the, you could say, um, from the top left of the goalie, and he's going cat a corner, and he receives a pass, and he just simply goes through the crease. Um, as soon as he steps in the crease, it's an immediate whistle because of the fact that he does have possession. Okay, we were talking about the previous previous play. Um all right, let's move on to the next one. And I don't think I have a question for play two. I do have a question for play number three. So you may want to scroll down, look at play number three question. And let's see, let me share the screen again. Application. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. I hope the video quality is going to improve on this one. So watch this a few times, guys, then scroll down to play number three. Let me see this and, one's not any better. All right, I just put some earbuds in. Is that better? That's... I, I think so. Okay. I don't know. Somebody said 100%. Casey said yes. All right, good deal. All right, so what we got here, um, this play is actually coming from the single side uh, point of view here. So um, whenever we are officiating play around the crease, um, we kind of have this uh, mechanic where if the player is coming towards you or away from you. So in this particular sense right here, the player is coming towards the lead and is going away from the single side. So the mechanic is the lead official is going to be looking at the player's feet and the single side official is actually going to be having to have the back of the player to watch for the push. This is a good play here. Uh, could probably talk for a long time about this one. Let's see. Let's see if people have voted. I have a question on the polls. Play number three. Best call. I gave two choices. One was crease violation play on. Uh, nobody voted for that. Everybody, uh, well, only one voted. Guys, scroll down and vote for, uh, well, there's only one other answer. I'll tell you what it is. White push, flag down, crease violation, whistle, white serves 30 seconds. Um, so what do you think? So the question is, does white 20, is that 23? Does white yeah. 23 push him? And does the black player, does he, does he leap? Does he dive? Do we have a combination of a push and a dive? Looks to me like black was going to go airborne whether he got pushed or not. He did not go airborne because of the push. But I think the guy does get a shove in the back, and then he enters the crease. What do you say, Dustin? I'm in the process right now. I'm trying to switch computers. Yep. So what oh. I see, Bill, is he he is he's probably going to dive, but it looks to me like he might have room to slip by there. I can't see the line really. I only see the soccer line. Um, but uh, the push, I, it looks. I can't tell when the push occurs. If he's already in the air, or the push kind of pushes him after he's after the dive in there. It's right. So, it's right when he's launching. It looks like right there. The guy's launching with his knees and his stick is on his back and he's following through right there. Yeah, so you definitely have a push. And the guy who did the push is saying he's in the crease and the black team is saying he got pushed. He comes up looking for a call. So what do you think, Lux? I think this is a kind of a good one. Yeah, that's a that's a tough that's a really tough call. That's um, uh, so his dive by him leaving his feet in his own volition does not necessarily mean 
the defensive player is clear to do whatever he wants to do to the guy. So now you got to kind of figure out where was he going. Look at, the, you, look at the yeah, look at the shot he's making. He's doing those little wraparound shot things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, does he touch the goalie? Is the goalie still in the crease? It's hard. I can't see the crease line very well. Yeah. But not even, even yeah. So we we ha we have a couple of things. We have a dive. We don't. I can't tell. Let's assume that he's gonna was gonna land in the crease anywhere and a push. Okay. So you have two two things happening at the same in the same play. Potentially, right? Okay, Frank is saying uh, if he's pushed into the goalie, then it's not his fault. That's true. So we do have a push, right? So yeah, I can't. T we can't tell from this angle, but to me, it looks like he wouldn't have touched the goalie. And to me, I'm not clear on from this view if he would have not landed in the crease. But we're going to assume that he left his feet and he could have landed in the crease. So now we, what I always have is my most fun thing is si uh, simultaneous. We have two 32 uh, simultaneous fouls, or a sim one simultaneous foul that are technical. So, well, in this case, though, in this case, if you were quick, you could get your flag out on the push, and then Black touching the crease is a, is a technical foul mm -hmm. by Black that ends the flag the down, that ends the goodies. Actually, so there'd That's be right. no time served by black, but white would go for 30 seconds. Correct. And if, and if it's kind of a, a wash, you can't determine between the two, you know, it's, he's airborne. You think he's uh, not going to be in the crease or he's going to be in the crease. Uh, we're going to have both, both events occur on the same play. Right. So then it's technical. It could potentially be a technical, technical simultaneous. This is where the crew's got to come together. Now, and when they're both technical fouls, you give the ball, there's nobody serves, and you give the ball to the team that had possession at the time. Well, Lux, I think I think this would be, uh, the, the push comes with possession, so that if you were, again, fast enough, you'd throw a yeah. flag. So, so now we have flag down, slow whistle situation, which changes a little bit because right. the technical foul caused by the offensive team during a flag down, slow whistle, ends the flag down, you blow the whistle, yeah. and right. they do not serve. So it's not a yeah. – they are technically simultaneous, but in, during a flag down, right. You're the, correct. the offending You're offensive team – now, if the offense commits a personal foul, they are going to go to serve time. But if yeah. they only serve – if they only cause uh, per, uh, right. commit a technical foul, their penalty is they've lost the advantage of the flag down – scoring right. attempt and and then the other option on this is if the guy diving has touched the crease before the push really the touching of the crease kills the play that's right, right? so, so yeah. then yeah, you're absolutely right. right um yeah. even so if you don't have time to blow your whistle the play is over yeah. and we don't generally call loose right. uh, dead ball technical push fouls. right right push right because there's no advantage right so just kind of looking at All this right. play again here um it it appears that a lot of the action is happening with the leads vision of the play blocked out by the actual goal. Um, yeah. With this in mind, single side would probably have this baby the entire way, uh, and he got he does need to come in and crash a little hard on the crease, guys. I can't stress enough about getting tight on the crease, especially when we have plays yeah. like this. We can't make these calls from the numbers. We got to get in and uh, officiate this play. Yeah, there'd be nothing wrong with running in even closer because you can smell these when they're coming. You can tell yeah. when those guys are going to the goal. Just run in there. Make it look like you want to get a good look because even if you don't get a good look, it looks like you were trying to get one. All right. Let's move on to the uh, to the next one. It's a good clip. Yeah. Let's go. So pay attention to the the riding team. I can't see his number, but it happens so quick. Let's see if yeah. we can see what happens here. Passes the He's ball to the goalie. Watch this guy right here. I know it's going to take a while. Uh, 
It's in the crease. Buffer. I have a question on play number four. Scroll down. We have three choices. And watch this play a couple of times. And then scroll down to play number three and vote on what you think is the best call you could make in this situation. When the goalie gets the ball, it looks, it appears the crease uh, attackman steps in the crease right there. He does. He, this guy, the guy standing on the crease line does step twice into the crease with his foot. Okay. Here he comes. Right, one, two, clearly in with his right foot, still right. in. He's on, he's dancing on the line. Okay, so, and the ball and the ball didn't start in the crease like right after a shot. Right, it was passed. It was passed into the goalie. The goalie's mm -hmm. got possession in the crease, and the riding attackman commits a crease violation. So the question is, what do you do when the goalie has possession in the crease and there is a crease violation by the riding team? That's the question here. So let me scroll down to play number four. We have four people have voted. Two people said play on, play on over because the goalie passed the ball out of the crease. Two people said play on, blow your whistle and call a crease violation and award the ball to White just beyond center X. In other words, a free clear. To White or to Blue? To Blue. blue. Yeah. To the clearing team, yeah. The rule is, and this is not a real super common thing. Uh, the more common thing is Shot. the guy standing there with his hands up and the goalie touches him. Okay, that's a goalkeeper interference. This situation, it's a crease violation with the goalie with the ball in the crease. But the, the uh, penalty enforcement is the same. If he does not complete his outlet pass, you award a free clear. Now, if the goalie were to take the ball and run out of the crease, it's over. If he, if he completes his outlet pass, it's over. But if, if he tries an outlet pass, as in this case, and this guy misses it, now we've got a, a cluster down at the other end, you blow the whistle and it's a free clear. Not yes. something that happens that often. One of the key things to keep in mind is that it's because of the goalie having possession of the ball in the crease. Pop right. quiz, if this same scenario were to happen where – Blue has possession of the ball, yet they are outside of the crease. And then the defense or the riding team now steps into the crease. What will we have then? That's a good question. So Dustin's saying nobody the, can talk, so nobody blue can team, the, the, blue team, the blue team has the ball, but they are not in the crease. He's standing outside the crease. And the gold player steps in the crease while the clearing team has the ball outside of the crease. Tim Casey says that's a flag, and Tim Casey is right. That's a technical foul with the clearing team in possession, so it's a flag down, slow whistle. It's a technical foul to step in the crease when the other team, when the clearing team has the ball in their stick outside of the crease. If they're inside of the crease, that's a crease violation. All right, we got to clarify this particular uh, play clip here. So Blue does not carry the ball into the crease. The goalie is standing into the crease, and he has Fast. passed the ball while he is in the crease. So there's no foul here on Blue. So once the goal team commits the foul, Blue has some options here, okay? The first option is he could wait four seconds – because we have four seconds to clear on the goalie to get out of the crease. The goalie can wait four seconds and then be awarded a free clear. Also, the goalie can make the outlet pass here. Now, when the goalie makes the outlet pass, if it's completed, the play on is off. If the goalie makes the outlet pass and it's incomplete, then we have a free clear for blue. And then if we have goalie interference – on the particular play on, well, that's just going to stop the play, and then we're going to award Blue the free clear anyway. So we want, we wouldn't have multiple fouls in this particular situation. It would just simply stop play, award the ball to Blue, free clear at the midline. So, Wesley, to answer, answer your question, yeah, you, we should have a play on, 
and then you watch and you see the, what happens to this outlet pass, this long pass. And when it does not give blue any advantage, you blow your whistle and you call a crease violation and you award a free clear at, uh, at center X and their offensive side. All right. I think, most, I think most people don't realize that the goalie can actually wait four seconds and still be awarded the free clear. Yeah, they never do. And probably if I was a goalie, I'm not sure what they're yelling play on for. So you you may be risking it. You know, you're trying to trying to read my mind. I've never had a goalie do it, though. I don't think I have. All right, ready to go on the right. next play, Bill? Yep. The choices are A, flag down for a white push with possession. B, flag down for a white cross check one minute. And C, flag down white cross check and then a second flag causing a whistle for white illegal procedure playing without a cross. Yeah, the, the video is so broken up right now on my end. Like, That's a shame. We, I, we're not seeing, I don't think we're seeing the cross check. Let me just, I'll go frame by frame it here and see if it. Okay, this white player is coming right at number two. And he gives he jacks him with his arms apart. Okay, yep, yep. There it and is. actually, if you he notice, actually breaks this cross. And there's his head flying. There's half of his stick landing on the field there. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. then watch what he does though. So there's a cross check. Okay. Anybody want to argue the cross check? No, I don't think so. Cross That's check. He broke his stick in half on the guy. But then he runs and picks it up. And he runs. And as he runs. He takes he a swipe it. at the guy with the oh, head. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I think we missed that in the actual game. I think I called the cross check, but did not pick up a little swat that he took at the guy with the broken head. And then oh. the only issue is is a scoring, you know, is scoring imminent on the second flag down. And that would probably not be at that point. So, like yeah, you said, so you go through the. Um chat box here frank says that it may be unsportsmanlike because of the broken shaft um yeah. well we're not going to go with the unsportsmanlike conduct on this because he just has a really hard cross check hard enough for him to crack his cross in half um so i mean this may be a scenario where your garden variety cross check may not be able to be called potentially but two minutes i mean very seldom do we have uh, more than garden variety one minute cross checks unless it's, you know, to the head and neck area. But if it's egregious, if it's egregious enough, uh, you may want to consider uh, going two minutes on a cross check here. Um, well, he already because... has a, he has a hundred dollar titanium stick penalty too. <laughs> He's going to have to take that up with his parents. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, it's starting to kind of, get better here and if if to the head then we have another issue because i'm not sure what bill said if it hits him in the head or not if he's up into the grill then it's a shot to the head yeah no i don't think he i don't think this check involved the head okay uh, of the of the uh, orange player i think it was just to his side yeah. So, okay, so Frank is saying here that he went after the kid with the broken shaft. So let's think about goodies, okay? We have orange in possession of the ball. We have a flag down for a cross check on white. And then if he continues to participate without a proper equipment, then that's a subsequent foul, and we would kill the play immediately by Federation rule. Um, and so – Unless – not, not immediately. Uh, unless it's an right. imminent scoring opportunity. If there's an imminent scoring yeah. opportunity, then we're going to give uh, the team an opportunity to, to finish that play. Um, and whenever we talk about an imminent scoring opportunity, we're talking about a player who is driving towards the goal. And in the event that he passes up GLE and he goes behind GLE to you know try and set up an offense, then we're going to stop that because that's no longer an imminent scoring opportunity. Um, but again, uh, I don't see an imminent scoring opportunity here. I don't know what you guys have an opinion on, but 
Um, once he has that cross check, and then if in your opinion you think he's playing with the improper equipment or illegal equipment, you can shut that play down immediately. Okay, well watch, watch right, okay. Now he's playing, the guy's driving to the goal, makes a dish and a shot, I don't know. I think that might be a goal scoring opportunity. He makes a dish. We're talking about scoring opportunity with the player, the player making an oh. imminent scoring opportunity. That's the one that we're looking at. If he passes the ball, then we no longer have that imminent threat there because he's not driving. Would I be wrong by that? So you think a pass to an open player standing on the crease, you've blown your opportunity? Oh, the answer to that. They don't define imminent opportunity. Um, it's not in the book. It's just no. what you think. Right. And now, did somebody did have a rule of thumb I heard at a meeting was talking about a rule of thumb if they keep going towards the goal. Uh, Lux, did you bring that up? Uh, have yeah, you heard so, that? Yeah, so what I use is, um, you know, if it's like out on midfield and there's players between him and the goal, call it dead. If he throws the ball out towards the side, call it dead. But if you if you've got an open play, a fast break heading towards the goal, I got an intimate scoring situation. If he throws it behind the goal line extended or takes the ball behind goal line extended, and where that comes from is the international cross rules. It's not. It's the kind. It is. It's just a rule of thumb. If somebody's doing something dangerous and stupid, like a kid running around with a half a stick, then I'm kind of leaning towards Dustin. If he's not immediately coming towards the goal, then you may want to blow it dead. So this is just. You you just got to be able to explain why you blew it dead and, and why you didn't think that was imminent and the danger was such that you, you needed to call it dead. So my, for me, it's. Uh, open path towards the goal, um, and a dish in front of the goal, you know, in the in the kind of crease area is still a good play, is intimate scoring. And if he if he starts dodging or moving side to side, we're done. We're 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 not, you know, it's a it's a moving firmly towards the goal. You don't want to punish the offense for the two fouls. Uh if they're gonna have a really advantageous situation going towards the goal. That that's that's my thought, and that's that you you and your crew. It might be worth something to talk about how you want to handle that. Okay. Well, I can tell you in that game, we did not uh, pick up on the guy sticking his arm out right there. We didn't. We missed that. All right, let's move on to the next one. Flag down. We're looking at play six here. Ooh. Play number six, yes. And I do have a little two question poll on this one. If you want to look at it, make up your mind and go down to play number six and vote. Basically, the questions that I put is this a is this a push or is it a cross check? Yeah, it's kind of bouncing again, Bill. It's hard to see, but it, it, you can kind of see him, you know, actually we can again. Right about the time he's getting ready to do the push or cross check, we're getting a, at least I am, I'm getting a break. Looks like Eric Sella. It is, yeah. You can definitely see here that the player in blue has his hands very wide. Yeah. But, uh, you know, assume, assuming, and it looks like he's cocking off to do a cross check from, but I don't ever see the contact. Is it with a, one of his glove hands or not? But if it's between yeah. the sticks, it's a, probably a cross check. But, yeah. I mean, um, does he hit him with the bar or push him with the bar? You know, does he, does he check him and hit him or get on him and shove him? No. I would say for me, if this was a big game with two good teams, I'd be calling that a push with possession. Now, Fisher um, was in great position to make the call. He's in the great position to see the contact because he's looking yeah. through him. Um, he's he's not looking at the back of one of one player. He's actually looking up. Uh, per perpendicular. He's got a perpendicular view. Right. So he can see exactly what's going to be making contact with the player. So like Lux said, you make contact with the glove. Um 
then we would we wouldn't have a cross check. And, and, and context, guys, remember this is a, a jumpy, you know, ten second clip. What's been going on in the game? Have we had a really clean, well played game between two great teams, or has it been getting chippy? And now we're starting to, you know, frustration, all that kind of stuff, all plays into you having judgment out there on the field. And uh, the rule book is set up to give you great latitude, and your calls just need to be consistent. Oh, there's a, you almost see it there. Yeah, you know, it's you know, funny uh, you bring that up. It's, it's funny you bring that up because. Um, we actually have a lot of clips from this particular game. There was a lot of activity. <laughs> and so, hey, um, you know, if you would have seen uh, some of the previous plays, we probably would have gone with the cross check. Um, but like Bill was saying, you got a tight ball game. Um, you know, I think. Yeah. So I, I think a push would be sufficient. So one of the things that uh, – so some thoughts to you guys as referees and then ours out there is um, on a chippy game, even in a close game, uh, you know, you've been letting them play and it's getting chippier and chippier. One of the things you can do as an R that I've used for years is, uh, you know, either I call the coaches to the box and let them know, hey, coaches, you know, great game, everything's going good, but it's getting a little chippy. So we, we officials are going to look to call it tighter. Talk to your players. Let them know that, uh, you know, this. you've reached our limit. You know, we want to see a clean game to the finish. You know, so you can I, – I, I would say, you know, do, do not start raising the level of calls late in the game without the coaches being – both coaches being equally aware of what, what you're doing and why you're doing it because the kids are getting chippy. Um, obviously, on a great team, two good teams playing – you want to let them play to the max extent possible, but remember, a no call on a penalty is is interfering in the game that you didn't call the penalty. So, uh, All right, moving on. Lot, to play lot, from the seven here. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Lux. My apologies. Uh, I think this is a game that Lux is officiating. Um, uh -oh. My fault. We don't have any. We, do we have any questions on this one, Bill? Play seven. I do yeah, have a question good. on play seven. There are three choices okay white, white push with possession for 30 seconds white cross check for one minute or white hit on defenseless player two to three minutes non-releasable yeah coming up from behind white player coming up from behind and jackson in the back <clears throat> a couple of things to notice on this play is we're we're in a face-off okay and so the ball has been possessed, um, and I'm not sure. The, I'm sure the official yelled uh, possession, but we didn't have a crank to wind possession. Now, just because the official doesn't wind his hand, that doesn't indicate that we don't have possession. The player actually scooping the ball and gaining possession is what constitutes as possession. But notice that guy on the restraining line just comes flying across the restraining line and makes contact with the – the defenseman or the long pole. I think this might be a, a long stick midi here. Yeah, number 21 at the bottom of the screen. 21 or 27. Scoops it up, looking for outlet pass, and he gets rocked by one of the uh, white attackmen on the restraining line. Um, this is Dustin, the official on the 45, the lead left. Uh, he does wind his arm. I, I can't hear him, but he winds it. Right there. Now they're coming out. Okay, yeah, there it is. It was quick. I saw it now. Yeah, it wasn't the world's biggest arm swing. That was a good toss, a good flag toss, though. Yeah. Well, I think that's – is that Lux? Is it Lux? You know, it's probably me on the 40. Yeah, this is a Jesuit St. Paul game. I think uh, – I think I, yeah, you did the Jesuit St. Paul game. Yeah, there's a flag. That's good. At least I got the call. It definitely looks like that's Lux. I, yeah, it's so jumpy. I can't see what happened, but I, I can see the things I should be thinking about is as the things you bring up in the question. Um, it definitely is a big hit. Flag needs to be down. So good, good on getting that. 
Uh, now we got the discussion of, you know, how flagrant is it? You know, what is it? Did he did he see the guy coming? It could be defenseless player, which now locks him in to two to three minutes. Or uh, I guess even a you know ejection if it's if it's really bad, but I can't I can't tell from my view. And help from your crew always, but we're really spread out here. Yeah. So it's 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 really on me if that's me at the forty there, Ed. It's really I got to be alert, and that's got to be my call. Your faceoff official, who's a single side, he's backing out. Um, the ball is coming toward well the ball's not coming towards him but the play is eventually going to be coming towards him because the blue team picked up possession so then your wing yeah, official, so he's now lead right he's backing up he's going to cover his goal on because we have blue with possession um so yeah we have a wide triangle which it happens we're going to have wide triangles in our mechanics um mm -hmm. you turned around just in time to see exactly what happened right all right but yeah, that goes to show though that you really it's just like that. I could have very easily missed that call um, if I didn't get happen to get my head around it. I'm not sure I got the right call. The next play here. Um... Oh, somebody's down. Situations where you have. Veteran officials working with newer officials. Okay. Um, not to say newer officials are not going to make this call or can't make this call, but sometimes whenever things happen that quickly, you kind of freeze up. And I've had that happen to me as an official in my early years. Uh, you see the call, it happens right in front of you, and then you freeze and you don't know what to do. And that's whenever your veteran official has to step up and help out. Okay. Um, so clearly, this play is on the single sides of the field. It's on happening on the single side part of the field. And the flag is actually thrown from the lead official. So that's just bailing your partner out right here. That's all it is. Anybody who sees this kind of play happen, Ooh. we need to have a flag on this. Okay. Ooh. And if you're the trail official who is becoming the new lead in this transition and you're 40 yards away and you see this happen, Bail your officials out and make this call. Come together as a crew and discuss it. Okay. And that's what uh, I think the lead official does here. I think the lead official comes in uh, quick and he's talking with the single side official just to make sure that they, you know, concur as to exactly what we're having, what we're going with. Um, but definitely here, this is a targeting defenseless player, and this is grounds for a possible ejection. Um, definitely worth a discuss discussion for ejection. He's got the crown of it. He's leading with the crown of his head to the other guy's head. Yeah. Yep. I can tell you this. Um, I was actually the official on the game that made this call. And one of the reasons why I did not eject him is because of where I was on the field. I was at the lead. I was around the crease. The ball, the play happened, you know, on the single side part of the field. Um, looking back at it from the camera view, we could all see, yes, I would have ejected that kid. Um, but I think we ended up going with three minutes locked in, non-releasable. Um, we did not eject the kid from the game on this particular contest. But it's definitely warranted the discussion. So, you know, for for all us old time refs too, we're having problems adjusting to this. At the high school level, Dustin's right. That is a clear ejection if you if you get good visibility on it. Uh, at the college level, it's a clear ejection and we're we're having to retrain our referees at the college level uh, to include me to make that call. Uh, so think about college football. And that helmet to helmet contact, these guys are getting ejected uh, for those kind of things in college football. They want that same thing in, in lacrosse. And at the high school level, we definitely need that. All right, looking at this next play here um, player in white with possession. He's a uh, top left from the goalie. 
And he is going to be contacted by a player in the purple jersey here. Looks like he contacts him with an elbow right into the head. Right after uh, he passes the ball. Right after he passes the ball, he gets, gets knocked in the head with an elbow, uh, knocks his helmet off. Uh, this is definitely a illegal body check to the head and neck area. Uh, the player doesn't launch, okay? But we still – we definitely have to have a flag on this without any question. Um, Y'all think it uh enough for targeting? You think it's a, enough contact for targeting? I don't know, but I probably would say if we had a huddle and talking about this is okay. Um, it's not just a, the helmets come off and everything else, uh, so it's up in the head. So it's two or three minutes possible ejection. Yeah, it's more than a I two minute. So yeah. we're at three, three, and now let's talk about it before any kind of ejection. But it may not be an ejection. I, yeah, I, I don't, probably I don't wouldn't. See any targeting. Uh, just a illegal body check to the head neck area, and it just so happens that it's hits him right on the button and knocks the helmet off. Just because, uh, well, we'll just we'll leave it at that. I'm gonna stop right there with that one. <clears throat> Wesley's question was based on the last clip. He said. Uh, when would we have a situation where we would have targeting but no ejection? And the best answer that I can give to you on that would have to be the severity of the contact, seeing the whole play. Um, yeah, maybe a missed, uh, Dustin, where a guy's going after him. You see the targeting is going to be clear. He's, he's mad. He's going after kids, and he kind of – yeah you know, wh whiffs and doesn't get clean contact. That's about the only thing in my mind right now. If you make solid contact and you're targeting, which is deliberate, yeah. um, and so that you're having to make that judgment call. Um, but if you had a kind of a whiff, then maybe you don't get the full ejection. But, you know, if you're yeah. targeting somebody, you're probably close to the ejection. Most yeah, times. I'm with you on that. We had another question, uh, a comment in the box about uh, a kid and his helmet coming off. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I didn't play lacrosse, but I did play football. And, uh, you know, just a lot of sweating going on. And my helmet would slide off rather easily. Um, and, you know, I would have to make sure that my chin strap was buckled tight on uh, all my straps just to make sure that I was secure because if not, it would just, like I guess I could just slide my helmet right off. And if these players are just loosely securing their, their chin straps on these helmets, they will come flying off rather easily, especially, you know, kids sweat a lot. Um, and you're right. The helmet shouldn't come off that easily with just a love tap. Okay. So this is clip number uh, 10. And I do have a question on that. Number 10, uh, three choices. No call, nothing to see. B, flag down, slow whistle for blue interference. Or C, whistle, white illegal procedure because he took a dive trying to deceive the official and a turnover to blue. <laughs> well, this is probably the third or fourth clip from this particular game. I told you we had a lot of good clips from this game here. I think this is uh, Airline versus St. Thomas Moore, and this is played up in Shreveport here. I'm going to say uh, Eric Seller, Zach Favreau, and I believe it was Glenn, Glenn Coleman. Glenn. Glenn, Glenn yeah. Solid crew up in Shreveport. So what's number four doing here? He's on the 40-yard line. He doesn't have yeah. the ball. His buddy's got the ball. But watch number four, white. Who's coming up? Does he do anything? No, not really. But what does four do? Oh, my God. He got taken out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's yep. see. Nothing soccer going on here yet. yet in the, uh, Snacker, soccer in sneaks the into lacrosse. Got a, got a couple of votes going in here. Whistle, white illegal procedure, took a dive, turnover to blue. 
Yeah, you know, in, in live, this God, is easy yeah. to see on the film. When I'm when I'm doing a game though, and a kid goes down, boy, I, I'm 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 have trouble saying you're a liar. I'm penalizing you unless I'm just real real sure. Like right. a little tap with his, and then a late head flick back, maybe that. But when they fall down, like I don't know if the guy didn't pop his ACL or something there, you know. So I'm I'm hesitant to call this particular type of one, but it's clear to me I, watching this that he was taking a dive. I, I usually handle that whole dive thing as get the hell up and you dive again. I'll, I'm going to take the ball away from you. Um, because what usually it happens when somebody takes a dive, it, they, they take themselves out of the play. So they're already harming themselves on the play. Um, yeah. You know, I, I usually just try to ha handle that with, uh, it's not necessarily preventative officiating, but unless there's, you know, a clear advantage gained, uh, which there isn't in this case. Guys just being a goof. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You just you just say, get up, stop acting like a baby. Play people <laughs> with us. Hey, you know what's funny is that um, while we was watching that game film, uh, that was not the only flop. We actually had another flop in that game. Uh, it was actually Hunter Stinson, <laughs> number 99 for uh, uh, St. Thomas Moore back in the day, which made Where's it even that? worse. Bill is getting on somebody about something. Bill is mad for that game. Three minutes locked for what was it? Yeah. It's still jumping, so I can't see that. But that's a beautiful call, nice and high, big, big symbols. So well done. Ooh, here we go. Yeah, so this is clear. Um, you know, blue never really establishes itself um, in making a lacrosse play. Uh, his head's clearly down. He looks, up, bam, he gets popped. Okay, these yeah. are the these are these are kind of the easy ones to make. Um, you know, it's right there in the middle of the field. There aren't very many players around him. Uh, again, this is something that we have to call. We got to have a flag on this, whether you're a brand new official or if you're twenty year official. <clears throat> if you are a brand new official and you see these kind of hits happen, throw your flag, discuss it with your veteran official, and uh, we'll make sure we get the call right. So, uh, the, but I am going to comment again, Bill's uh, signals, guys. If you notice, the signals are high, kind of out like you're projecting to. Thank you that you're in the big uh, stadiums and you're projecting out to the second deck. So people behind you, everybody can see the call. Don't hide them down in front of your chest or your stomach. Nice big signal so people can at least see the penalty, what you're calling. Real, real high and uh, well done there, Dr. Bowman. Perfect. Take me to dinner again. I'll, I'll say <laughs> something else. <next> <clears throat> All right, so I think these plays, these next few plays here are going to be dealing with um, – let me take a look real quick here. Yeah, so the next few plays are going to be dealing with whether a team is off size or not. Oh, boy. And so what I want to discuss with you before we even get into whether or not the call is off size or is clean – we count forward, okay? The myth is that we're counting back to make sure that we have the, the numbers back. Well, the numbers back isn't really that important. We have to make sure that at all times that we have no more, is considering that we're in an all-even situation, that we have no more than six players on offense, and no more than seven players on defense. So that would be your three attackmen and your three midfielders. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you're going to have your three defensemen, your three midfielders, and your goalie. Okay. Now, certain situations are going to happen where, you know, we may be man down. But if you look here, <clears throat> five, six, seven, blue, eight, the goalie has eight defensemen on the field. Okay. They're playing defense. And so this would be a flag down situation. Flag down, slow whistle, and then we wait for goodies to happen. Um, if it was the offense that was offside, it would be an immediate whistle, and the play would be restarted where we stopped. 
in the uh, the old rule in the past was that offsides was a free clear. That is no longer the case. It is simply a turnover and a restart where the ball stopped, where the play stopped. One, one point on the restart. Most of the restarts are always quick. These can't be so fast because you got to give the team that was offsides, you know, you're going to um, – the offensive team, for example, is just offsides in that case. It's just going to be a technical foul turnover. You've got to give the off that offensive team a chance to get back on sides. I'm going to so take it a step bust I'm going to take it a step further, Lux, and I'm going to say we don't give them an opportunity. The officials, we have to make sure that we reset yeah. the field. We make sure that that right. guy gets back on the correct side of the field before we restart. Okay, so this one here, I want you to notice at the top of the screen – um, that we indeed have players serving penalty time, okay? Um, white is clearing. And uh, go ahead and pause it right there, Bill. You can see that there are two players for Team White that are serving penalty, okay? So if we're allowed to have 10 players on the field and we are allowed to have – I'm sorry, if we are allowed to have 10 players on the field and we have two players serving penalty, that means we can have eight players on the field at one time, okay? So that means that we can only have four players in our offensive half of the field, okay? We should have a goalie and three defensemen on the left side of the 50. I mean, sorry, the right side of the 50. And then on the left side of the 50, we would be able to have three attack men and a midi or two attack men and two midis, whatever the case is. They can't have no more than four players in their offensive half of the field when they have two players serving penalty. All right, so go ahead and play this clip. Let it, let it roll. So we can see here we count. We have one, two, three, four, five white jerseys in the offensive half of the field. There was nobody who was subbing in late. Uh, there was no crazy transitions that were being made. It was a simple clear. The player who was in possession of the ball made number five. So as soon as he crosses the midline, that's an immediate whistle. Now, those aren't always going to be caught because those are a little tricky, remembering that you have somebody serving penalty. The official is in the proper position. The single side official has the primary responsibility for offsides, and he is on the cone where he's supposed to be. So right now, at this point right here, as soon as he crosses the 50, we should have a whistle. Now, that's if you're um, – I'm not going to say counting correctly, but if you're, I guess, great at calling offsides. Offsides is one of the toughest calls to make in lacrosse. And they finally realize how many people are supposed to be in the offensive half, and the official makes a call to change possession. Um, unfortunately, the – team in purple instead of having a new possession around the midfield they have a new possession inside of their uh, uh, the attack area white's attack area so we're talking about a difference of 20 to possibly 25 yards difference of a restart um, so kind of a disadvantage to blue but nonetheless we get the call right and we get blue with possession for the new officials, <clears throat> see how these players, they know to take a knee or to sit in front of the table and nobody else should be in there. So it makes it easy when you glance over, oh, I got two guys in the box. Sometimes, if it's in, especially younger players, they'll be standing over here talking to the coach or you, you don't know who's supposed to be in the box. So they have to, by a rule, sit or kneel in front of the scorer table so that you can get a clear view and look over and tell or remember that there are two in the box. I guess if you were a very good official, you wouldn't even have to look. You just know there are two. I've not achieved that state of nirvana yet. I have to look in the box to remind myself that there are players in the in the box. All right. This next play that we're going to be looking at here is a, a classic textbook um, scenario that you're going to see happen um, quite often in a lacrosse game. Um and one thing that I want to say about this next particular clip is that what you're going to see does not always constitute as a player being off sides. Okay. So you see here, kid goes over the midline accidentally. He, he's supposed to be back. He mistakenly um, 
catches himself, but his body falls forward. Okay. Now, I guess in a sense, by position, this player would be offsides. However, we don't want to be quick to make this call. We want to make sure that they have the proper numbers. Team White could be in the middle of a substitution, which would they would only have five white jerseys in their offensive half of the field. And that player that knows he's supposed to be back accidentally falls over the midline and touches. He may not potentially <laughs> be the seventh guy. So we have to make sure that we're counting forward, not backwards. Um, when that – when that guy goes over the midline, he we now have two players plus the goalie in the defensive half of the field. But if we're in the middle of a substitution, that's fine. So let's go ahead and count the players in the white jerseys once this player touches over the midline. Okay, there's one, two, three, four. Five. Uh-oh, six and seven, plus a goalie. Too many. Okay. So we should have had three attackmen back, and then our goalie, our three defensemen, and our three midfielders. When that attackman, that's when you're going to see it. The, uh, the riding attackman is not aware of where he's at on the field, realizes that he's getting close to the midline, tries to stop his momentum, and he falls over. Now, would we have a call if that player loses his balance, takes his cross, sticks it over the midline, and stops himself with the cross? So basically he's a tripod with his feet and the stick. Would that constitute as offsides? And the answer to that would be no. It has to be a part of his body that touches over the midline in order for him to be con constituted as offsides. So Wesley has a good – good. Uh, I think he's talking about this one. Um, so is an advantage gained, right, uh, is kind of his thinking. The way I manage that on an offsides call, first of all, a technique here is on the count. When that guy kind of falls over, uh, you can put a hand up. You don't have to, but start your count with him. He's number one. I, I like to try to remember to put my hand up. That lets the coaches know and everybody know that I'm, I'm, doing, I'm checking it. I got that guy. One, he's over. Now I start counting everybody else and blow the whistle when I figure out there are seven, uh, eight guys, eight guys over the line. Now, as an official coming up the field, if uh, – if you know the best when because everybody kind of sees that right so you don't want to not call it when you are coming up and they see you looking right at that situation if the guy is coming up the field to try to make a check on somebody and take a slash or a one-hand swing at him and they fall over the line i got you baby that's a penalty right because he's he's being he's he's really was going after the dude and here he is he's swinging yeah at him. he is uh, chasing so, Yep. So I would make this call a play. Now, what I do is with the dude who's kind of jogging up the field and accidentally steps over the line, I I never see it. I, I don't see it. It's, no advantage was gained. He didn't he didn't do it. I, I I'm not looking at it. You know, I just I don't look there. You, and you then know, there's rule twenty two dash two. When the score is twenty two to two in the fourth quarter, <laughs> yeah. you don't call that either. And that's right. number two that stepped over. I didn't see that so, one either. So that's a that's a good comment, Wesley. But remember, anything that happens on that fifty and between the restraining lines is tends to be right in front of the benches. So they'll all see it. You need to make sure you're in a position as an official <clears throat> to either make the call if you want to make it and sell it, or not make be in a position where you don't have to make that call. Right? You, you, you let it go. And so one thing um, also in dealing with offsides is that. Everybody in the world sees that there are only two guys back, and the coaches are going to be screaming, he's offsides, he's offsides. Okay, you can't be fooled into making those calls just because you hear the coach scream offsides and you look back and notice that there's only two attackmen back. Okay, 
Um, so we always want to make sure that we're counting forward. Eyes have to be forward. If it takes you a second to make sure you get your count and you get the call right, that's fine. But don't make a call because the coach says he's off sides, and then you start counting players and you have the right count. Now you have to say, okay, we have an inadvertent whistle because, oh, wait, the count is correct. Coach, you don't know what you're talking about. So um, just some officiating philosophy here. The next couple of plays that we're going to look at are going to be dealing with warding or unnecessary roughness. Um, <clears throat> so if a player has both of his hands on the cross, he can make contact with an opponent on his cross to create separation. However, he cannot use his body to make separation on his opponent's body. Also, you cannot use your free hand to create the separation, whether it be on the player's body or his cross. So just kind of keep those in mind. Essentially, uh, NFHS is taking away the bull dodge. And if you see a player get blown up, okay, you have to determine whether or not you think it's a warding or if you think it's an unnecessary roughness. Okay, so we're going to watch a couple of clips here, and you make a call and see what we got. We have he white. rocks him back. Guy's head goes back, and he knocks him on his butt. I think in college, Lux, help me, I think that's probably a weight room issue maybe these days. Both hands stay <laughs> yeah. on the stick. But in high <laughs> school, they don't want you They don't want you going to the guy's body. Um, right. So, so at a minimum, a ward. That, that's a, yeah, that's a hard ward. And if it, if you think he really went after the guy to knock him on his ass, then you could do the unnecessary roughness. Now watch the guy who gets uh, knocked down. He plays like uh, a possum, yeah. fairy dog here. He's <laughs> yeah. down. He says, "Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, wait, I'm supposed to look hurt." So he puts his head back down. <laughs> so you you don't necessarily <laughs> award that behavior, right? You know, it, it's <laughs> embarrassment. You know, he got run over. Nobody likes to get run over. Um, I don't see any kind of intent here. Uh, he's dodging, and he's, he's just reckless. He doesn't know where that's he's the fullback. That's yeah. the fullback going up the middle. Yeah, and I would call it – I would probably call that, again, not knowing anything else that's occurred sure. in this game, I would probably call that as a ward. He, he kind of like, comes off of one guy and runs into the next. The, the guy um, who got hit actually braces himself for the contact. Like he was going to imply a check and make the kid in, in, in the white jersey go down to the ground, and he ended up getting run over. And he's like, oh, I just got run over. I got trucked. Um, See, so yeah, I think we just have a ward here. I don't think we have anything more than a ward. Yeah. Um, and then the nice thing about the ward call here is you do the ward call, ball changes, you get that quick whistle and get moving up the other end of the field, and all the whining stops. People get off the ground and get moving. You know, these guys were about the same size, looked like they were pretty strong each, so it was physically matched. If that big guy came in and hit little Timmy with his glasses on, who's a ninth grader, it probably might have looked a lot uglier and it could have been a it could have been an unnecessary roughness. You know, I'm not liking uh I'm not liking my single sides position here. I think my single side is too far out. I'd like to see my, my single side official closer in. Um yeah. Yeah. you know too far out. We want to. We tend to have a wide triangle in settled situations, I guess you could say. But in tight play, when we have somebody who's dive, you know, dodging and driving to the crease, we we got to get in. We got to get close enough to where we could actually be in the pr proper position to make these calls. We can't. We can't make these calls from being outside the numbers or close to the sideline. But, we got to get in. But on a positive. But on a positive note, at least he's down. At least he's gone deep. Yeah. Uh, he needs to be in more, but he, at least he's down deep. Yeah, he's not on the 40 yard line. Catholic 17, Capital Zero. That's high school. This here, um, you have a, a typical playing with the free hand situation here. Um, I. And this is, you know, I'm probably, I know I'm doing the wrong mechanic, but instead of me giving the, the ward call, I tend to do playing with the free hand kind of signal here, because you know, even though it is a ward, um, you know, just kind of explaining the call in a sense. It is a ward by definition, 
Um, but the explanation would be that he's playing with his free hand. He's swatting away the cross of an opponent, or he's swatting the body away of an opponent. Um, so this would what be- I have the habit of doing is I I say I give the ward signal, but I yell free hand. I yell yeah. free hand when I don't do that. Sure. Yeah, I and I tend to do the illegal procedure playing with you. Know, with the yeah, free hands. that is friendship capital here. This is friendship capital versus uh, Catholic. Catholic high, yeah. mm -hmm. right. As long as you get the call, it's a technical call. Yeah, you, you can't have that hand off the stick. You know, blocking away the other guy. And you're going to see this or happen a lot in the scrum. This is going to well, especially on a face off. Yeah. Got to watch this one a bunch of times, maybe. Yeah, this is going to be kind of hard to see. Look at the kid in the middle of the field, probably around the 16-yard line, 17-yard line. Right there, he's standing on the 18, 17, 18 right now. Dude, all we're doing is... Wait a minute. Say that again. I saw a flag go down. All we're doing... He's dead. Yeah, the, the action actually happens around the 18, 19 yard line. Dude, all we're doing is, uh, if you if you find oh, number gee. eight, white jersey number eight, pay attention to white yeah. number eight. Yeah, I, I had the advantage of the sound too, and you can hear this. Uh, <laughs> you get hit. We got a question here. With a team like Friendship, are you calling a lot looser and letting them learn a game a little more instead of calling everything? Yeah, you know, that's that's a good um, a good question there. Yes, I would say that in the, with a situation like that, we would tend to call things a little bit more tighter on the more skilled team and be a little more looser on the team that's not as skilled. Um, but when it comes to safety fouls, we can never let those get away because of the skill set. When, when you have technical fouls that could be 50-50, we're always going to side with the no call on a lesser skilled team just because we want the kids playing lacrosse. So, yeah, you definitely want to have that mentality. But definitely don't do this, don't do this with safety fouls. Great, great uh, discussion there. Um, and the one other thing I would add is get the ball off the ground. It, you, it balls on the ground, there's a scrum like this, find a push uh, on the uh, – the white team give it to blue and restart it and get going again because only bad things can happen with the ball in the ground for with this kind of game. Does everybody see the bad thing that does happen? I want to, yeah, right there. Let's see some Ooh, there's stuff, stuff happening in the chat. Let's see some stuff happening in the chat. What y'all see? Y'all see. Actually, I have a question. Scroll down to the question. Play oh, okay. number 18. This is the last question. The last question. The last poll, guys. Wake up. Scroll down and answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> scroll down and choose A, B, or C under the polls. No, Casey. That's not quite what we're looking at. Look a little harder at the clip. Look at a player in a blue jersey. It's going to punch him. Right? The white's pushing him out, pushing him out, and he doesn't like it, so bang! Boom! It gives him a right cross. <laughs> right hook. That's a right hook. Frazier goes down. <laughs> There's a right hook. He's gone. I tell you, when I first saw this clip, it didn't jump out at me. Uh, there's a lot going on in there, and I can see how if your eyes are not right on that, I can see how you could possibly miss it. So this is where I get back to that loose ball in a scrum with a team that's not really that you know great or bad weather. Get the ball off, find the technical foul, get the ball and up in a stick. Yeah. And yeah. With a scrum like this, um, I think I think the officials are in pretty good position. They're not getting too tight in a play. Sometimes if you get too tight in a scrum, you miss things like that happening. I think with the uh, the triangle that the officials have here um, are in good enough position in order to, to, to see the action here. And you can see that they do throw some flags. I'm not exactly yeah. sure if they had the – the uh, the foul for the the punch here, but um, you, you probably it. heard it. Yeah, <laughs> Howard Tracell just announced the punch. So, Dustin, what is the penalty for throwing a punch and hitting somebody in the head? Okay, so if we have a punch here, and we're gonna hit somebody for fighting, this is gonna be an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. 
This is going to be on a player, so it's going to be a three-minute, non-releasable penalty. The kid is ejected, okay, um, without a doubt. He didn't get five for fighting. Uh-huh. <laughs> so what do you? So what do you do with him? He well, goes serves his time, <laughs> and then leaves. Well, see the thing here is he. This is an away team, and it just so happens that the away team is from Mississippi. We have a Pascagoula Mississippi team playing against the inner city New Orleans school, um, so we can't just ship this guy off. If there is uh, no bond, if there is no bus or no adult to take care of this kid outside this facility, he can go to the sideline and just stay there. Okay. He, he can be um, placed on the sideline and have, you know, be monitored by an adult, but we definitely don't want to ship kids off out of the, the campus or the stadium without any type of uh, supervision. Wesley Green, this clip is two years old. <laughs> he got a ticket in a school bus on the way home. <laughs> I think I think Wesley Green was coaching Pascagoula at the time. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. Um, so yeah, we like I said, um, just get the kid on the sideline, get him, take his gear off, get somebody to watch him, um, and and just be done with it. He does not go to the penalty box. He goes away. Either he leaves with an adult supervision, or he's or he stays and is supervised by the coaches, but the in-home goes into the penalty box and takes a knee for three minutes, non-releasable. Yeah. All right. Play number 19. All right, this one's fun. This is a game that uh, I think it was Bill, Lux, and I, the three of us, that were officiating. You don't have any questions on this one, huh, uh, Bill? No. Uh, you don't have. I do any- not. I, we're, okay. we're done with the questions. All right. So on this particular play, we have three fouls that are going to occur. Uh, we're going to have two fouls, which you'll see one coming up shortly here. There's another flag that just came into the screen. We have three fouls on the play. Two fouls against blue. One foul against gold. When the play starts over, you'll notice that the lead official is going to have a foul for what he has called as a holding. The single side official is going to have a foul for some dead ball activity. And then during the penalty administration, there is a third foul for unsportsmanlike conduct. So we're going to see the play over here, uh, re roll it a few times. <clears throat> Single side trying to get out of the way, moving towards the in the sideline to cover that line. Lead has a foul. That's the hold. And notice that the goal player number six kind of stands over the um, player that he takes down. Okay, so the single side here has two flags. There's a lot of laundry on the ground here. Now, it does look like the, the, the cross gets tangled up in his legs, and one would be inclined to potentially call a trip on this. I think the official makes a good decision with going with a hold on here. Um, yeah, watch how it starts. Number six is going to hook him pretty good. He hooks him here. Sticks getting tangled up. Impeding yeah, his motion. Him. Definitely a good, good call on the hold here. Frazier goes down, and then you notice the player steps on top of him, okay? That's where your flag comes in right here. Nothing good can happen whenever you have a defenseman standing on the top of a player that's on the ground. So that's taunting. you got to have a flag for that. you got to be mindful of these kind of things happening. This is a rival game. Uh, this is a, a high-intense game, okay? Just like the officials coming in between. you got to get in there between those players. You don't have to touch anybody. Just make yourself present, okay? Get between them. Don't let any more action happening. I think the second flag was because uh, the blue player got a little upset and started throwing some f bombs um, yeah. towards the th- towards his opponent. Okay, so we got three fouls here. So far, we're fixing to have a fourth. We have a hold for gold, and we have unsportsmanlike conduct on gold, and then we have unsportsmanlike conduct on blue. 
And I think here we're fixing to have a fourth foul, which would actually be the third foul for blue. So let's talk about restarts and time serving and um, non-releasable penalty Locked time. In. Okay, we got a lot of we got a lot of activity going on in this play. Okay, so let's talk this out. Due to the fact that we do not have a whistle to restart play between the action of all of these fouls, regardless if they're live ball or dead ball fouls, the common time between all of the penalties are going to be non-releasable penalty times. Okay? So we had three fouls that happened during the dead ball. We only had one foul that actually happened during the live ball. It was the 30-second hold. That was during the live ball play. So the 30 seconds for holding is going to be non-releasable. The one minute on the unsportsmanlike conduct on gold, that's also going to be a one minute non-releasable penalty. <clears throat> However, so regardless, regardless, regardless of the simultaneous situation, regardless of the simultaneous situation, the unsportsmanlike that was called on number six gold would have been an unsportsmanlike non-releasable foul regardless. The same as the first unsportsmanlike conduct foul on blue for number 31. His would also be an unsportsmanlike non-releasable penalty. And then we have number 12 walking through the middle of the field. And I think he has a few choice words with me. So he gets one as well. Um, <clears throat> So again, by individual calls, the three unsportsmanlike calls that we had on blue, just by the individual call, those would be all one minute unsportsmanlike non-releasable fouls. However, because of the fact that we have simultaneous fouls, we have fouls occurring from in between the whistles, all of the common times are going to be locked in. However, the three unsportsmanlike calls, the, un the three unsportsmanlike penalties, they're all going to be locked in. So basically, everybody at this point who is serving penalty time is going to have non-releasable fouls, and they're all going to be locked in. The first foul was, was the six. gold, number six. And then from that point, once we start having all these dead ball fouls, the one thing that comes into play is order of occurrence. So six had a live ball foul, and then he has a dead ball foul. Then the third foul was on number 31 blue, and then the fourth foul was on number 12 blue. So after all the dust settles, the possession of the ball is going to be for gold. Okay? Now, due to the fact that these were considered to be simultaneous fouls, Gold is going no, to have not. a free clear on the restart because no, 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 they're not simultaneous. So the, it's a dead ball foul. It's a dead ball foul, uh, and they get the ball at the at the midfield line because of the dead ball foul. Simultaneous starts at the position of the ball, so okay. they're not simultaneous. It's just all the fouls occurring between the whistles. Between the whistles, correct. Right, right, right. So that's the difference. Simultaneous ball starts in the same position of the field with the team with the less amount of time, but this is not a simultaneous. We had only one live ball uh, foul. That was the hold. That's and that's only locked in because it's it's one in a whole series of other penalties coming. So that gets locked in for thirty. Then we have all the unsportsmanlike dead ball fouls. Then work with. It's it, whatever the last team, you know, just keeps going back and forth, but all of them were blue fouls. So I think all the unlocks were. So, uh, I mean, all the unsportsman likes. So gold gets the ball midfield, uh, just like any other penalty, dead ball penalty. Yes, the hold it. Listen again, Wesley, the, the, and everyone, the hold is locked in because the, between a whistle ending play, and a whistle starting play, all fouls that occur that are uh, serving during that time have to have the, you know, the common time locked in. So the hold is non-releasable because all these other fouls are occurring also during this dead ball. And these, these, um, all these fouls are going to start serving at exactly the same time. 
So that's why it's locked in. Both teams have a penalty in that whistle from stop to start. So the common time, like Dustin said, has to be served uh, locked in. A little easier, though, a little easier on the when do you lock in the lowest common time on players of opposite teams in the box. It really is not always related to simultaneous. It's players who start serving their penalties on the same tick of the clock. It could be all. It could be. All, it could be dead ball fouls. You right. still lock in the lowest common penalty time when they start serving. Players of opposite teams who start serving a penalty on the same tick of the clock, the lowest common penalty time is served by is served locked in. Now, usually when there's a simultaneous fouls, you do have players of opposite teams going to the box. So that usually happens when you have simultaneous, but it does not only happen when you have a simultaneous, it can happen with live ball, dead ball, dead ball. When you got a, when you got guys from different teams going to the box before the next restart and they're all starting their penalty time on the same tick of the clock, lowest common time is non-releasable. That used to confuse me. I used to think that it was only simultaneous, but it's really if they start serving on the same tick of the clock, regardless of how they got there. Right. And then, Dustin, do you want to go through the, what the three unsportsmanlikes were so that uh, – Okay. The-, the three unsportsmanlike conduct fouls that we have. The first one is right here. Pause it. You see here number six is standing and hovering over the top of uh, his opponent. Okay, he- so that's gold. So that's gold no. on Sportsmanlike. Okay, so if you notice, if you back it up a bit here, he doesn't start out on top of him. Okay? He takes him down. All right. Go ahead and stop it there. He takes – let it play out. He takes him down, and then he comes over the top of him and hovers over the top of him. We so there's not, two penalties. So there's can, two penalties there. There's the hold, then the unsportsman. Okay, so the number six here hovers over the top of number 31. This would be uh, a dead ball, unsportsmanlike conduct on number six. So you can see the flag coming flying high, or you don't see the flag flying. You're going to see the flag drop in just a second here. Then 31 is going to get up, and he's going to start dropping some F-bombs at number six. So when I hear that, there's my flag coming again. Now I'm running between them. 31's got a dead lock on number six. So here I am going in between the players. Okay. Now, none of this would have happened, assumingly, if number six would have just stayed off the top of him. Okay. So at this point right now, we have two unsportsmanlike conduct fouls, one on gold and one on blue. Plus the hold. Plus the hold on number six. And then in a second here, you're going to see another flag drop on the ground for the player who's mouthing off to me at the top of the screen. Um, So number 12, he said that my wife was ugly, and I wasn't having that. He said what? He said what? (laughs) So... He got a he got an unsportsmanlike conduct foul for that one. My wife was standing next to me. That's why I said that. <laughs> so Blue only had two unsportsmanlike. Six gold had a holding penalty and an unsportsmanlike. So Correct. there was right. two. There's two blue, one gold, and what that gold player has a total of uh, one and a half minutes. Right. Now let's talk about this for a second while we're here. Let's just say that the flag wasn't thrown on blue number 12 and the only fouls that we would have had for this particular play would have been blue 31 for one minute unsportsmanlike conduct a one minute unsportsmanlike conduct on number six and a hold on six would we still have the same setup would we still be restarting with the same team at the same spot yeah the last penalty was a blue unsportsmanlike on 31 when he got up Dead ball. Person. Dead ball. That's right. Order of occurrence can be determined. Okay. So whenever you have a situation where order of occurrence can be determined, that offended team is going to get possession of the ball to start the next play. So the the situation where un, uh, dead ball uh, order of occurrence might not be able to be determined 
is for some reason you don't really see something, but really it's a fight. It's kind of the typical one. If they're yeah. if they're duking it up, that's where it can't be determined, and that's when you get a simultaneous foul on a dead. So that's a good clip. There's a lot of action happening there. Well, I don't remember this game. I don't remember all those calls. I guess you forget <laughs> bad things. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Next play on play 20. Wait a second. We got one more question. Does it matter okay. where an occurrence in Federation? It, uh, no, it only does in dead ball. No, it does matter in Fed Federation also. It's the exact same thing on yeah. dead ball foul. <clears throat> yes. Exactly. The same. <clears throat> All right, so what we have here, this one is uh, something that we I've just started sure seeing recently here as um, as Louisiana teams are becoming a little bit more skilled and a little bit more knowledgeable of just the overall um, game of lacrosse. <clears throat> you see now that um, when we have these terms called a yard sale where – a cross gets checked out of a player's hand. Um, everybody goes crazy. And then you'll see the defenseman take his cross and try to swat his opponent's cross out of the play. Okay. That's in sports. Mode. We can't have that. Okay. Make the play, make your yard sale and be done with it. If you see a player try to scoop up the, opponent's cross and fling it into the stands or to the sideline or wherever the case may be. We got to get a call on that. Okay. Notice before this though, what did we have before all this action happened here? Ooh, a push or something right there. Yep. Yeah, push. White push. six with possession. Black yeah, pushes push. from behind. Yep. Flag down. Push. Flag Do down. Slow whistle. Yeah. yeah, he had possession whenever he was pushed. So we got flag, flag down, slow whistle. Flag coming, yep. Okay. And when you see this activity right here happening. Right there. Okay. I'm trying right there. Yep. Now let's talk about that for a second. Because does he actually make the scoop and toss he's attempting to but what does he really do touches his opponent's cross do we want to be that good or is that a situation where we could do some preventive officiating and say hey 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 get off his stick we don't want to see that kind of action happening or do we want to penalize that immediately because nothing good can happen when number 11 makes that attempt to swat away that stick he missed it the first time, and he got it on the the, the down swat. <laughs> you know, I think it's either a conduct or unsportsmanlike. Is it yeah. uh, well, kicking the yeah. kicking the player's cross is a legal procedure, I think. But yeah, it depends yeah, on how you actually, kick it. It could be unsportsmanlike if you, depending yeah, on how but, you did it. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, kind of re relieving him of his stick that's on the field is a, is a uns more of the unsportsmanlike kind of thing. So, um, but you're right. You, again, like we said earlier, know that those lacrosse rules, you can potentially sell anything from talking to them to 30 seconds to a, a minute unsportsmanlike. I don't like seeing this. They're definitely like Dustin says, it, it, there's no good that can become of this thing. You can hit the guy. The guy could be trying to get to the stick. He's flipping it off the field. Uh, I'm seeing unsportsmanlike, Jim. Yeah, it's uh, it's unsportsmanlike behavior. You know, that's not sportsmanlike. You're not playing lacrosse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's away from the ball. There's a lot wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <clears throat> you know, okay. I, I guess you know the only the only debate on it is that what he was attempting to do, he missed. He was wanting to scoop that stick up and sling it as far as he possibly could. But he missed on his uh, he, he missed on his attempt, and that's the only thing that I was debating. Yes, it, by rule, everything that he's doing is unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, so we have two good questions there. Uh, Casey's asking, 
if that stick was broken and you thought black was trying to be safe and clean up the garbage, would we still call it? I've never seen that happen. And you shouldn't, the, the opposite team, if it's not your stick, you leave it alone. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, if he picked the pieces up and ran off with them, that's probably sportsmanlike. <laughs> probably wouldn't yeah. penalize that, but he's not doing that. Yeah. And then uh, Wesley's asking about the push, wondering if that's defenseless. No. Well, that wasn't no. a bad bad hit. That was your garden variety push. Yeah. And yeah. if we're going to call pushes in the back defenseless because the player can't see, then would be a whole lot of two minute penalties yeah. out there. So no, that wasn't a that wasn't a vicious violent check intended to hurt the guy. Yeah, the defenseless player comes to a safety situation. That's not. He's, <clears throat> he's just being a jerk. Yep. This kind is kind of a rare one. Yeah, this is an, in, an interesting play. <laughs> Sorry about the video, guys. Thought we had had that solved. He was, oops. Oh, he used his hand. <laughs> he bats it to the goalie. So There's only one, one person that can bat the ball <clears throat> in this crease. That's it. That is the goalie. That's the fun one. You never get to make that call. Yeah. Yep. He That's does a good job of putting it right in the goalie stick, though. He does. And look, that, that ball. What did what did uh did I did I use the proper signal here? You did yeah, not. It would have been perfect, but Dustin. Uh, I what think does he, he do? Legal I'm procedure. Let's see what he did. You can yeah, get he's given the he given an IP. Oh. So, Come on, Dustin. So That's the, not a legal procedure. It's got its own go. separate s signal. But, but the important thing is you don't know what to call a technical flaw. Illegal procedure always works. <laughs> right. It, it yeah. caught about surprise here. <clears throat> yeah, I did give the wrong signal. That's a football call, Dustin. You should be able to make that one. Yeah. It's almost midnight here. <laughs> oh. Behind, it's behind our pictures. You know, we see this happen a lot. Your attackman gets beat. Yeah. Your Smack. clearing team is getting ahead. And the attackman makes a sloppy check with a one hand. And they never make contact where they're supposed to make contact. You can see the kid in white here. He's throwing his hands up like, you know, am I, I going to get this call? Uh and that's one that we need to start making more. You know, mm -hmm. we, 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 have, we have kids that are making checks in places where they're not supposed to be checking. And the only reason why they're swinging their cross at the players is because they got beat. That's it. And um, it sets up and it sets up this other contact that happens that yeah. looks like it's actually legal. That would have never occurred. Yeah. Likely it would have occurred. Um, yeah, don't it's, let them get away with this. And so, this you know, you got you to gotta kind of judge on how hard was this contact made. Was this just a little love tap to say, hey, I'm here, you know? Um, it looked like he got him pretty good. So I would be inclined to have a flag on that. Uh, we have the trail official, the lead slash new trail, who's coming up from behind the play. We have our single side official who's at the cone on the 50. Okay. We get some help from a veteran official working with a younger official. Um, you know, typically, whenever you have um, these types of plays happening, we try to stay out of somebody else's pawn and let this particular official either live or die by the call that they either make or they don't make. Um, so, you know, you can go either way. I don't fault the official on the other side of the field for, you know, Let me go. Yeah. You know making the call. It All looks right. like we got about, what, 29 seconds left of a live stream? Probably. You want to quit? Let's quit. That's good for now. Yeah. We got we'll 22 plays later. here. We were anticipating that we was going to do at least 20. All right. Thanks, guys, for putting that together. That was that's nice.